As cliche as it sounds, this program is brought to you by viewers like you. We are non-corporatized news from the streets and therefore we don't have a lot of money. So in order to become a patron of ACT OUT and keep us bringing you independent non-corporatized news, visit patreon.com slash ACT OUT. This week, in a special episode, we talked to Bushra Al-Fusail about her home country of Yemen, the many faces of and reasons for the veil, and most importantly, the U.S. involvement in the Saudi war crimes in Yemen, and her activist work in raising awareness to remember Yemen. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is ACT OUT. Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. We have another special episode for you this week, and get ready to be a little bit uncomfortable, my fellow children of the empire, because this is all about our role in war. Specifically, Yemen, which we're not technically at war with, but our bombs are. Well, bombs and other horrific objects of war, such as white phosphorus, a skin-melting chemical, which last week U.S. officials admitted to selling to Saudi Arabia. Not only that, they're not quite sure how much they've sold, when it was sold, and how many times they sold it. Yeah, I mean, you know, that shit just slips your mind, doesn't it? Now, interestingly enough, unlike cluster bombs, which the U.S. has also sold the kingdom, there is no international ban on white phosphorus. The 1980 Convention on Conventional Weapons did state that it could not be used as an incendiary weapon against civilians, which the U.S. conveniently echoes in its claims that it only sells this shit to other countries, quote, under the condition that it only be used for the purpose of creating smoke screens and signaling to troops. Oops. Hmm. Well, that's interesting because, well, I, see, I wonder if the white phosphorus used in Gaza to cause what Human Rights Watch called needless civilian deaths was also sold to the Israeli government under that same condition. It's a bit like that old adage about gossip, easy to spread, but like blades of grass in the wind, it's damn near impossible to pick it all up again, or really even know where they went. So a bit like that, but you know, with bombs and chemical weapons. I mean, even with technologically advanced tracking systems, it's impossible to know who the $110 billion worth of weapons sold to Saudi Arabia since 2010 have killed, maimed, or displaced. But what we do know is what an integral part of this conflict we are. We're important. We're necessary. Not so much loved, but needed. Indeed, we've bolstered Saudi's offensive with everything from the aforementioned white phosphorus to Abrams tanks, machine guns, heavy tank recovery vehicles, ammunition, smart bombs, and intelligence assistance, making it so that some of the Saudi weapons systems are so complex and dependent on U.S. spare parts that they would be grounded without American assistance. And these far-from-grounded weapon systems then go on to bomb schools, hospitals, residential neighborhoods, and businesses. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department, who is clearly really pushing the boundaries of irony with its chosen tagline of diplomacy in action, boasts that Saudi Arabia is the U.S.'s largest FMS, or foreign military sales customer, and goes on to outline the incredible ways in which they will continue to bolster these anti-terrorism efforts in an attempt to stabilize the region and support counter-terrorism efforts, there's just one problem. The weapon sales have the exact opposite effect. As Senator Chris Murphy, sponsor of the Senate Joint Resolution 39 to halt weapon sales to Saudi Arabia said as he introduced the bill, I'm increasingly worried the Saudi-led bombing campaign in Yemen is not supporting U.S. national security interests. It's clearly creating more, not less, space for extremist groups to operate. Yeah, because that's what bombs do. I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. You cannot bomb people into submission. You can only bomb them into extremism. Stability is not attained through war any more than peace is attained through bombing or lower teen pregnancy rates through teaching abstinence. If the State Department really wanted to live up to that fucking tagline and put diplomacy in action, 
It would halt all weapon sales to a dictatorial regime that only seeks power at any destructive cost. And we'll hear more about the kingdom in a later episode, but for now, let's focus on Yemen. Because, as our guest will note, not many do take note of the country at the back end of these arms deals, the people and places literally impacted by a swipe of a pen, a handshake over military contracts. It's a blip in the digital landscape of election updates and Brangelina gossip, but right now I am asking you all to focus. Because not only is this real, a real fucking issue that involves the death and suffering of thousands, but it's on us. Yes, on us, the American citizens who live under the regime that perpetuates war and promotes terrorism. But don't just take that from me. Bushra al-Fusail is a Yemeni citizen who last week visited D.C. in order to meet directly with lawmakers and urge them to support the joint resolution to halt weapon sales and encourage diplomatic relations over warmongering dictatorial coalitions. Outside of this pointed policy activism, she has also produced a video series called Voices from Yemen, a video series that shares the stories of Yemenis so as to bring us into the reality of this conflict, the human lives that exist in those dollar signs and the continued suffering that literally has our names written all over it. In addition to her work in videography, Bushra has also done a lot of work in photography, focusing much of her lens on capturing women both unveiled and veiled as a powerful commentary on this politicized issue of veiled women as it relates to both women's rights and Islamophobia, a powerful female voice from Yemen that every American should have to listen to. Bushra al-Fusail, take a look. Before we get into the um, your most recent project, The Voices of Yemen, I wanted to ask you about your photography um, frame, the idea of using photography to visualize and analyze issues, inform, document, and publish. And specifically, you I saw some amazing photographs of women in particular, both veiled and unveiled. And in fact, there was a, an image where, you, where it had half of a face of a veiled woman and then half of a face of an unveiled woman. Talk a little bit about this as in regards to women's rights and um, and this and your photography and photographing women in these different states. Uh, so basically, I started uh, the photography in two thousand and nine, uh, and that happened when uh, I used to work in a film production company, and we used to do uh, short documentary films about women's rights in Yemen. Um, and that field uh, just opened my eyes that. I come from a middle class family that I had a lot of privileges, mm -hmm. which I used to drive my car, I used to go in, to school, I'm not veiled, but going out and seeing other cities and getting more involved with a lot of Yemeni women made me open my eyes that no, most of the Yemeni women, they don't know what it's their rights and mm -hmm. they don't know that it exists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I decided to to be a photographer, to raise awareness with the Yemenis with a very simple way and a visual way to see what is it, what they're missing, what it, what does it mean humans' right and women's right. Mm -hmm. So I decided to do uh, exhibitions in, in, around the Yemen, uh, speaking about uh, women's issue in Yemen. So to, to you, um what what do, what does the veil represent to you? Because when you came in, you were you didn't have the veil on, mm -hmm. and you decided to put it on for for the interview. So what is the significance of the veil for you? Um, for me, it's part of Bushra. It's part of being Yemeni, um, and um, I, I I just love a pair with the hijab because that's my Yemeni people. They know me as. It's so hard for me to. To gain their trust, if they saw me, right. I changed because they know me like this. So, I mean, of course, the the, the American understanding mm. of hijab and, and, and the veil is very um, stunted and mostly incorrect in, in, in a lot of cases. So what would you say to somebody who, who says that, oh, well, the veil is a sign of, of female oppression? What would you be your response to that? Well, um, honestly, in Yemen, I'm going to be honest, uh, I used to hate uh, the veil. Um, my mom is veiled. Uh, um, we're different from Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. because in Saudi Arabia it's it's by law. Right. They have to, but in Yemen it's by culture mm -hmm. that that I didn't want. I wasn't uh, okay with it. 
But speaking about this, um, I don't have the rights to judge anybody. Like I have amazing, strong ladies in Yemen. That's how I changed my mind about uh, getting bailed or not. They're so strong and they're leaders and they're mm -hmm. bailed and they have five kids and they finish their education and they're super awesome. So we cannot judge a person about what they're mm -hmm. wearing. They're, they're very nice and they're creating, they're fighting for peace. Mm -hmm. And does not mean that they're veiled. This is what they're comfortable with. Right, and this idea mm -hmm. that it's, it's, society's, uh, it's society's right to tell a woman that yeah. she should or should not yeah, have yeah, yeah. any form, any article of clothing exactly. on. Exactly, it's based on the woman. She decides yes or no. We, we cannot decide, oh my God, like, this is how you dress and this is how you're not supposed to dress. And of course, then, you know, like you mentioned, that decision coming not from a, an oppressive male person, not from an oppressive religious uh, person, but from you interacting with other women. Exactly. This is the out picture that the media says, oh, my God, the, the woman in Middle East, they're forced to bail their, their, their faces. But no, my mom, my mom, I'm going to talk about my mom. She's not forced, but she's comfortable with and she's an awesome lady. Like she raised, I don't know how many kids, and we're a big family. And and yeah, I, I met a lot of amazing women. They're built, and yeah. they always underestimate women that she's built, that she can. She's not educated. She's not strong. She's a. She's she's always behind the men. No, they have a voice, and they're fighting for it. So speaking of the of the voice that you mentioned, um, shifting now to the the Voices of Yemen project, which there were. Um, there were women that were three women that in the videos that I saw. Um, I'd like to I'd like to talk first before we get into that. I'd like to, because this is something that you don't hear about when we talk about war torn countries. We just see it as like the now. But I'm interested to hear about the Yemen that you experienced as a child, and not just before we get into to what's happening right mm -hmm. now. Tell us a little bit about the culture in Yemen and your experience being a part of that culture. Uh, for me, what was hard that I, I it's at the end of the day, Yemen is a patriarchy country, mm -hmm. and year after year, getting much worse, especially after the Wahhabis started to get in Yemen in the first seventies, and you could see the changes. Like my mom, she used to veil with a very colorful fabric, and but year after year, you would see from the Gulf this black abayas and mm. covered from the head to the toe. But before that, I didn't see it. But I could see that was the hardest thing that I saw the shift in, in Yemen that everybody started to get bailed more. My mom, she was like wearing something very open and chilled and you know, they don't care about their hair through the shows or part of her neck or her hands. Mm. But after the Wahhabis uh, in Yemen it started to be very, very, very bad, especially, especially like the early marriage in, uh, in Yemen and the health for women and there's no education and that was the hardest thing. So talk about the the conflict then, um, the sort of like a, a backstory of the conflict and um, also discuss that the U.S. involvement, the selling of weapons and the close relations uh, to Saudi Arabia and of course the current U.S. Uh, part of this Saudi-led coalition. So uh, basically, as I said before, uh, the Wahhabis started to get in Yemen in the uh, beginning of the 70s, late of the 60s. And that's when you could see the Yemen started to shift like a weird country. Uh, we never had a good relation with the Saudi Arabia. They always treated Yemenis bad. And Yemen is the poorest country in the region. Mm. Um, but suddenly after, like out of nowhere, uh, in March 2015, um, at 12, I still remember that day, at 12 uh, a.m., they started to bomb us. The U.S. are backing the Saudi Arabia. They're selling them weapons. And that's how they started the war. If the U.S. didn't support Saudi Arabia with the weapons, they would never bomb Yemen. Is there an understanding uh, in Yemen as to why arbitrarily just last year this started? I mean, is there any sort of ideas as to why or was it just like because we can? It's just a matter about controlling um, the all region. They're controlling all the GCC countries. Mm -hmm. So Yemen was the only country that wasn't. And Yemen is a very tribal 
country, um, it was hard for them to, to control Yemen. Um, so it's a very simple thing that Saudi Arabia want to control Yemen because of the port, because of other sources as well. So with the Voices of Yemen, how did you come to, to start working on this project? And how did you, how are you, I mean, because I understand it's still ongoing. How did you find these people? And in particular, I was really struck by the, the little girl. How did you find your, your subjects? Uh, well, um, I lived under the airstrikes for four months, so I really know how how awful and how tragic to like to live under that situation. And when I decided to come to the States, I was like, okay, I'm burned out. I need to take a, a break. But, but I always felt guilty because I live in the United States and the United States are selling weapons to the Saudi Arabia. So I... As part of being Yemeni, I had the responsibility to talk about my people, especially my mom and my dad and all my family are stood there. Mm. Um, so I have a lot of connections. There are a lot of people, they refuse to go out of Yemen because of the resistance. They want to stay for their land. Um, so this, what, yeah, like, um, the only news that I can get is from social media. And that's how I decided, like, with, with Coat Pink, to bring voices because Americans need to see something visual in front of their mm -hmm. eyes to hear it. What is it? What the Yemeni people are suffering from your weapons. Yeah. And since the American uh, people could, could vote to block this deal, so they need to see it. And I'm trying to raise awareness and educate American people to what's happening. It's, and it's your money is... is killing my people. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of, of Chris Hedges telling some, this was actually at the Code Pink Saudi mm -hmm. summit, um, somebody standing up and asking Chris Hedges if, if you know, we can really say that uh, Americans are to blame because, um, you know, we don't, a lot of Americans don't agree with war. And Chris Hedges was like, do you pay taxes? Do you, yeah, yeah. Then it's your fault too. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the thing is in Yemen, if you're gonna ask anybody, What's the war? Who's, who's bombing Yemen? They would say Saudi Arabia and the US. They're aware about mm -hmm. everything that's happening. And if you're gonna go in the capital, Sana'a, you're gonna see a lot of, like, a lot of hate towards the Americans and they just don't understand. Like, it's hate for generation what's gonna impact mm -hmm. the American citizens as well. It's like, yeah, it's awful. They, you create far more terrorists mm -hmm. by, by bombing. Um, so the... Something that I noticed in, in one of the videos, you had the you had a quote by Chris Murphy, Senator Chris Murphy. It's not a Saudi bombing campaign; it's a U.S. bombing campaign, which you just which you just mentioned. Yes. Every single death inside Yemen is attributable to the United States. Um, so I know that you were just on the Hill today um, sp uh, with Code Pink about this issue. So how how does our policy need to change and talk about this in this particular bill, but also what deeper issues do we need to address, um, and what would a more diplomatic Middle Eastern policy look like? So uh, we're running this campaign uh, uh, to we're trying to block a deal. It's one point fifteen billion dollars of weapon that these weapons are gonna be under my country's sky. They're gonna bomb my people, which is awful, and. Um, we're trying to block this deal with, with, with educating people, with reaching a lot of uh, senators, and me as a being Yemeni and being, I was in the war, tell them what's, how do we feel about it and how the U.S. need, like, they bombed 650 schools, hospital 600, it's like awful. 80% from the Yemeni populations are dying from hunger because of the siege. They're not allowing Yemeni to go out. Even if they want to run away from the siege, they can't. They're, they're, they're just trapped in one city and being bombed. They're not allowing any medical supplies to get in. Nothing, it's awful. Sounds like Gaza. Honestly, very similar. It's similar tactics used yeah. by exactly. US-backed yeah, yeah. <laughs> regimes. So I'm going to, I'm trying to meet all these people that have the power tell them what's my personal experience in the war and how they need to stop this madness. And the U.S. needs to stop selling weapons. What has been your experience like today or, or other times that you've met with U.S. officials? 
Well, there is some people that were sympathized with my story, but I think this is the way they, they see it. It's like business and money, and for them, it's business. This war made a lot of people rich, unfortunately, by killing thousands and thousands of people. 10,000 people hurt, already been killed in Yemen because of the U.S. Uh, weapons. So something, um, something that I was really struck by in one of the videos, uh, Reham, if I'm saying that correctly, mm -hmm. uh, shows us around her old neighborhood, which is now mostly rubble, and uh, says, please bring us home. And as an American citizen, uh, I can't help feel that she's talking to me. Like, it's my responsibility to help bring her home. Uh, because this is something, you know, it's, it, it's sort of like the, the issue of the ages, how do you make the politicians see this? But I feel like it's easier to get to, to regular people, regular Americans who can imagine what that might be like to have your entire neighborhood in rubble. So in, in that sense, what can like the average citizen do? Um, what can we do to help stop this, stop this uh, death and destruction that's going on in Yemen? As an American citizen, uh, call your senators. This is the first step, and it's very easy. Just call them to stop the weapon deal. And it's the power now, right now, is by the American citizens. The, the Reham is, is one of my friends, and mm -hmm. she, five of her family houses got completely damaged, destroyed. And not just houses, entire families inside. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine her uncle was calling her to so he could be saved, but he was dying under the rubble because nobody could pick him up. How awful is that? And not a very unusual story from what I understand. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of things we don't see. A lot of things, like, it's not documented. This is the difference between Yemen and Syria. Syria, they're aware about they need to document everything that's happening. But in Yemen, we're very simple. We, we're very, we don't have these smartphones. We don't have electricity. Um, they're not aware about what they need to document and show the people what they're suffering for. They're very simple people. And what I think is interesting is that you say they're simple people, but at the same time, like particularly that little girl, 10 years old and incredibly eloquent and also so knowledgeable. I mean, she mentions that the U.S. is doing this. And to have that understanding of foreign policy at such a young age is incredible. And that's not anything that you see... I mean, it's very rare to meet a 10-year-old in the U.S. who has an understanding of foreign policy. Because I told you, when you go out in, in Sana'a Street, you would see all the hate towards Americans. So, of course, the, these kids are watching these every, th uh, every day. And the, she mentioned that uh, young girl that the Saudi Arabia are lying to the world. Yeah. They're not saving the Yemenis. They're killing us. And she's aware about it. And that's awful how many generations are going to grow up on that. What other policy, um, what other policy do you see being necessary to to make our role in the Middle East less atrocious as it is today? Honestly, I would say we uh, we have been protesting for one month. Uh, we're trying to block this deal. They could join us. I need American people to be to have solidarity with Yemenis because with the, without them, I cannot block this deal. I'm a Yemeni person that I'm trying to speak on my country. But it's the power, it's you guys. The power is with American citizens, that they could come up very easily. Like the least they could do, just call the senators, mm -hmm. hashtag remember Yemen, this is what we're doing with Code Pink as well. Uh, talk about it, uh, make a, lo a lot of people, they don't know that what's, uh, what the government is doing to my country a lot. And that was, yeah. I was so shocked by, by talking to a lot of Americans in America that they don't know about it. And I was like, how come you don't know what your government is doing? For me, it's, it's shocking. I don't know. For me as an Yemeni and from the Middle East, we know what the government is doing. And they're most corrupt, and I'm not going to tell you they're angels, but, but still, like, we're aware about it. And this is what I was shocked that the Americans, they don't know about it. Uh, so I'm, cu I'm curious, I'm cu as somebody who's, um, who has this sort of experience in both cultures, why do you think it is that Americans are totally unaware of what their government's doing? Uh, honestly, I think as part of the uh, American government strategy to make people busy in their lives and to put them uh, in a bubble. And of course, most of the people, they're on their comfort zone that they don't, don't want to think about it. Uh, 
-hmm. And they don't want to hear that, oh my God, your money is killing yeah. that child. You know what I mean? They don't want to think about it, which is they have to wake up. They have to wake up because, guys, everybody going to face it if we're going to completely be in the same madness. Yeah. And if we're going to experience this, like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's awful because it's going to come back mm -hmm. to, 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 to America because a lot of generation going to hate this country. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm trying to say. Like, wake up, America. I, for me, I don't want anybody to experience airstrike or seeing their fam, part of their family getting killed under rubble or all this madness that I have experienced in Yemen. A day after our interview with Bushra, indeed on the International Day of Peace, the Senate joint resolution was blocked, 71 to 27, thereby greenlighting a $1.15 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia. $1.15 billion. And while this isn't necessarily surprising, it's certainly disgraceful. However, as Code Pink pointed out in their announcement, activism did push 27 senators to vote against the arms deal. Activism like Bushra's is raising awareness and pulling into sharp focus our complicity in the crimes of our empire. And we need to use these facts as inspiration. We need to not let this setback set the stage for others. We cannot let this decision decide the future. React, regroup, and keep pushing for peace. And a friendly reminder, 88% of Congress is up for re-election in November, so get activated. We actually could vote these fuckers out of office. Because peace is not something that you can pray for. It's not something that you can hope for in the safety of your little cocoon. It is something that you have to push for, act on. You have to do something, and that starts with the awareness that Bushra mentioned. So to see the vid videos that she produced, to share them and get activated in the peace movement, visit codepink.org slash Saudi Arabia. And when you share this episode, be sure to use the hashtag RememberYemen to continue the promotion of awareness and activism. And with that, we will wrap up this week's Dose of Dissent. Thank you so much for watching. Please do spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. As always, take a look at the last slide to see the sites mentioned in this week's show. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit patreon.com actout.